Welcome to the podcast. This is a different um, podcast in the sense that it's in English, American English and Queen's English with a Danish accent, Michael. Welcome, because our guest today is uh, Michael Cannon, who is a health analyst from the US. I'll present him in a minute. And we'll be discussing the US healthcare system. Should, to the extent that it has problems, should we uh, blame them on markets or on government in the US? Uh, thanks a lot for joining us, Michael. Michael F. Cannon is um, Director of Health Policy Studies at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., which is a free market think tank that subscribes to libertarian or classical liberal ideas. He has previously served as a domestic policy analyst for the U.S. Senate Republican Policy Committee, where he advised the Senate leadership on several policy issues, but including health care. Michael Cannon is a member of the Board of Advisors of Harvard Health Policy Review. He is an economist by training with a master's degree from George Mason University, a great university. So, Michael, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, let me first set the stage a little bit because, you know, why would a Danish, this is normally a Danish language podcast and the, the audience is Danish, why would we be interested in discussing US healthcare? And the reason for that, or not German healthcare, which, you know, is our neighbor. And the reason for that is that uh, the US healthcare system is seen as a sort of prime example of a free market healthcare system. So whenever I or someone else in Denmark, or I imagine around the world really, uh, argue for free market solutions to healthcare problems, or even for moving healthcare in a free market direction, even a slight direction, opponents would immediately uh, point to the US and say, look, um, There are problems with the healthcare system in the US. That's a free market system. You're proposing free market solutions. Not a good idea. So that's that's sort of the the, the, the frame, the reason why we're interested in having this uh, discussion with you about the US healthcare system. What to the to the extent that it has problems, are they caused by government or by free markets? So, so let's start out in that way. Uh, how free market is the U.S. healthcare system, really? Well, first, thanks for having me, Martin. I think that this is an incredibly important question, one that uh, has uh, – and there's a there's a myth here that has impoverished our understanding of the U.S. health sector here in the United States and the debate over health reform around the world, which is this myth that the United States has a free market in healthcare. Mm -hmm. If you go to the OECD, if you look at the data they compile about uh, national health systems or the markets, the health sectors of the economies of uh, advanced nations, what you'll find is that the OECD ranks the United States, uh, well, first highest in terms of health spending. That's one of the complaints about uh, the US health sector is it is so expensive. It's uh, highest in terms of health spending in absolute numbers is a share of GDP in per capita terms. But there's one uh, graph that most people don't look at when they're or, or don't display when the uh, when they're talking about uh, uh, the United States and whether it's a free market or not. The OECD uh, has compiles data on the share of health spending within each country that is voluntary versus compulsory. And you would think that if the United States has a free market in healthcare, it will have one of the smallest shares of health spending that is compulsory and one of the largest shares that's voluntary. In fact, the opposite is true. The United States, in the United States, according to the OECD, 83% of health spending is compulsory, not voluntary. So compulsory, that means that you have to, to, uh, to it, 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 the government forces you to spend it. It's, That's it's right. A language explanation for those who, who may not know what that word, word means. That's right. Now, if you, if you only look at government spending versus private spending, you, you'll think that it's an even split in the United States because the government spends... 50% of the money that the United States spends on healthcare and the private sector spends the other half. So now I should say parenthetically right there, that suggests by itself that the United States does not have a free market in healthcare. If the government is taxing away $2 trillion from 
the from from U.S. residents and controlling that spending itself. That is not a free market if the government is controlling half of the spending. But in fact, oh, but the OECD. Let, let, let me just. Um, but but it, it is true that compared to other countries, if if that's what you're looking at, if, if you just look at at government spending. Uh, the U.S. is in the lower end compared to other countries. Denmark has a much is, higher proportion that is that is government spending and much lower proportion that's private spending on healthcare. That is correct, uh, but I think that is sufficient to uh, to uh, dispel the myth that the United States has a free market. If the government that's is true. controlling half of the market through its spending powers, then that's not really. Um, uh, a free market, if only because the government is taxing, as but I Danes say, two trillion dollars. Danes could still argue that if if I said, look, we're, we're spending, I don't know, eighty percent or something like that, uh, got the government spending eighty uh, percent on on healthcare, and we should bring that down to fifty, then people could still say, oh, you want something that's similar to the U.S. and look look what, what that has brought them. It's very but- expensive. Perhaps, but there's another component to what the OECD is measuring when it says compulsory spending, and that is that a, a large share of what we call private spending in the United States is still compulsory. It is spending that the government requires people to do or else they will face penalties. And if you count both compulsory government spending uh, and compulsory private spending, where the government penalizes you unless you spend your money the way the government wants, then health compulsory health spending in the United States it adds up to 83% of health spending. And that's actually that is, similar. That is almost the same uh, share as uh, in Denmark. Actually, 80, yes. 82 or something like that. We're, we're about right next to Denmark. It's Denmark is also 83%. Okay. So here... The United and and the United States, according to the OECD, ranks number nine, ninth among OECD nations in terms of the number or the share of health spending that is compulsory. The number number one is Norway at eighty six percent, and the United States is number nine at eighty three percent. So there's a lot of nations right there in a very close band uh, of of um, of percentages there that uh, where. I would argue the role that the government plays is similar, mm. even if it is even if it's different in terms of how the government, the decisions the government makes uh, about the control that it has over the health sector. Those decisions might be different from country to country, but it, what those countries have in common is that the government controls six out of seven dollars that those countries spend on healthcare. So the United States, I would argue, is no more a free market in healthcare than Denmark or Norway is. What distinguishes the United States is the type of decisions the government makes with the control that it has over the health sector. And you might prefer uh, uh, you might prefer the decisions that Denmark makes or that Norway makes with, uh, with all of that government control. Uh, and so might a lot of people in the United States. But the the problem is when you cede that control to the government, you cede control, and you are you you don't get to make those decisions yourself, and so you might prefer uh, a health system where it the 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 delivery of medicine is totally integrated, like it is in the British National Health Service or the Veterans Health Administration here in the United States or the private sector health plan Kaiser Permanente here in the United States, but. When you give government this kind of control over the health sector, you you may not get that choice. You may not get the choice of a system they have in Denmark. You may not get the choice of a system they have in Norway. You're stuck with whatever your government gives you. And in the United States, there's a lot of dissatisfaction about the the, the choices government makes in our stead. Yeah, and as Hillary Clinton said, uh, the U.S. is not Denmark. <laughs> There was it a, is not. There, Den- there, there was a Bernie Sanders. Uh, she was in a debate with Bernie Sanders, and then he was he was talking about Denmark, and and she said, "Well, the U.S. is not Denmark." And you know, I, I'm not a, I'm not a Hillary Clinton fan, but that that's actually a very very smart sentence because because it is you know comparing a small country like Denmark, fairly homogenous uh, ethnically, although that's changing somewhat now, but still uh, to the U.S. Uh, you know, huge, both geographically and in terms of population, different states, different traditions, different norms and values. 
it's a completely different story. But and for- and Denmark is Denmark is about the size of Maryland, which is just a medium sized state in a nation with 50 of them. Yeah. And on top of that, I'm glad you brought up Bernie Sanders because Bernie Sanders also perpetuates a myth, a similar myth, or you could say the a, a reverse of this myth about your country. Bernie Sanders likes to talk about Denmark as, it's, as if it's a socialist paradise because there is a lot of income redistribution. But as your colleagues have pointed out, there, there might be a lot of income redistribution. But other than that, you have a very free market yes. in, that, that, in, in Denmark. We're actually very high on the economic freedom index. Uh, so on, on that you know there are two indices, uh, and I think we are higher than the U.S. on one of them actually. Um, so that's that's overall. In terms Don't of rub it freedom. in. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, but anyway, a small nation has to be very high on an index like that. It's easier for a large. It's it's j- just as bad, but it's easier for a large country to be somewhat protectionist without it being too harmful. But you know, if Denmark gets very protectionist, there'll be stuff that we simply wouldn't be able to get because it's too small a country to produce it ourselves. And also, it, we need to be very attractive for business uh, because uh, otherwise, investments will go elsewhere. Well, the U.S. can be lazy about being free market to some extent because it's a very attractive market uh, on its own account for uh, direct investment. That, that's, that's not uh, an argument for being lazy. I'm just sort of explaining. <laughs> or for being big. <laughs> no, exactly. Good point. Anyway, let's get back to healthcare. Tell me what's going on there. Um, uh, what what is the uh, the what brings it up from around fifty percent to around to eighty three percent? How is this compulsion? How does that work? So the fifty percent is uh, an array of government programs uh, uh, for different populations in the United States that uh, amount to few, less than half of the total population. Uh, I like to say that in the United States, not only do we have socialized medicine, we have every kind of socialized medicine. For veterans whom I mentioned, we have a British style national health service mm-hmm. where the government provides health insurance to this population and it owns the hospitals and it employs the doctors. It is all one system. For low-income people in the United States, or ostensibly for low-income people in the United States, we have a uh, a program we call Medicaid, which is a lot like the Canadian Medicare program. We also have a Medicare program. I'll get to that in a moment. But our Medicaid program is like the Canadian Medicare program or the Canadian health system, where the central government collects a lot of money uh, and makes a lot of rules and sends that money out to the provinces or the states. And uh, with some direction about how to spend it, but the provinces or states have some flexibility. So that's our Medicaid program. It's a lot like Canada's health system. We also have a Medicare program. Our Medicare program is the largest purchaser of medical care in the world in terms of dollars spent. It covers about 60 million elderly and disabled U.S. residents. And it really drives the U.S. health sector because it is such a big spender. and, uh, and, and, and this mo- program, mo- most of the health care care that people need, they will need when they get old. Anyway, I mean, uh, it, it, there's an enormous. Even though it's, someone like uh, a twenty year old will, you know, cost will, will ha- it's it, the, the likelihood that that person will have any significant medi- medical spending is is very small. But as you get older, the likelihood increases, uh, as we all know. And and so, is it everyone over the age of sixty five that is? Uh, is it a universal system in that sense? Is everyone it is, over it is universal? There are negligible exceptions uh, to the rule that over age sixty five, everyone enrolls. So in, in the U.S., if the by by the time you turn sixty five, you're really part of a universal healthcare system similar to what mm-hmm. we have in Denmark. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Well, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure exactly how similar it is, except for the universality. But the Medicare program, because it is covering the oldest, sickest part of the U.S. population, that's really what drives uh, the the spending and makes it one of the one of the uh, or the largest uh, purchaser of medical care in the world. But that's all on the government side uh, or on the explicitly government side. Half of the U.S. population, a little more than half, 56 percent, has health insurance through an employer. Now, why would we have health insurance through an employer? And by the way, that's akin to the German system, because a lot of uh, Germans have health care through employment. Why, though, in the United States, do we have 
uh, do we get our health insurance from our employer? I get my health insurance from my employer, the Cato Institute, but I don't get my car insurance uh, or my homeowner's insurance uh, through the Cato Institute. Why do I get health insurance through an employer? And it turns out the reason is that the U.S. tax code, the federal government, effectively penalizes us unless we get health insurance through an employer. Uh, if, he, if a lot of people call this a tax preference or a tax break for employer sponsored health insurance. But the way it ends up working is if your employer gives you a dollar of cash wages, that dollar is subject to uh, income taxes and uh, a couple of different payroll taxes here in the United States. And you end up losing about a third of that dollar. On average, you lose it. At the margin, you lose a third of that dollar to taxes. But if your Lock, employer gives you- Lucky bastard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we lose if your about, employer- We lose about half? 48. Yeah. yeah. If your employer gives you that dollar- So so this, this sort of tax provision would have an even bigger impact in Denmark. If your employer gives you that dollar as health insurance, buys you a dollar's worth of health insurance instead, no taxes at all. If you took all of your income in, in, in terms of health insurance, you wouldn't pay any income or payroll taxes. And what that does is it says that if you want to take that dollar yourself and buy, choose your own health insurance, buy your own health insurance, you effectively have to pay a 33% penalty. So most people let their employer control that dollar and let their employer choose their health insurance and enroll in a type of health insurance that isn't their first choice. And that is really lousy health insurance when you think about it, because it disappears it is not universal or, or, or it's not seamless. It disappears when you change jobs. Or if your spouse is your connection to that employee, to that insurance, it, it disappears when your spouse dies or divorces you. Or it might disappear when you turn age 18 or 26 and go out on your own, no longer stay on your parents' plan. This is, this is a, and people have lost health insurance uh, for this reason after the, for all of these and other reasons, after they've gotten sick, leaving them with uninsured, leaving them uninsured and with uninsurable pre-existing conditions. This, this is probably the biggest source of dissatisfaction with the U.S. health sector beyond the spending hmm. is that so many people for so long have had difficulty getting health insurance because they had it while they were employed. And then they lost their job. They were sick and they couldn't purchase health insurance anymore. I mentioned the Medicare program. It's there for people age 65 and over. It's a universal program for people age 65. The reason we have a Medicare program in the United States is because of this provision of the tax code, which threw people out of their health insurance upon retirement. 40 years after Congress, after the federal government put this provision of the tax code in place, they looked around and they said, oh my God, there's all these uninsured senior citizens Let's create the Medicare program. If the government hadn't been throwing them out of their insurance for the past 40 years, they could have purchased health insurance that covered them until death, but uh, but they didn't. So yeah. So and it's it's from a free market perspective. If we imagined that uh, you know, if we we're to create a health insurance system from scratch, uh, it would be an absurdity to end it at 65 or 62 or, or whatever. Or when you, when you change job. jobs. Yeah, the average yeah. American changes jobs a dozen times by age 52. Wow. And and we're, why should we change our health insurance a dozen times? That yeah. just doesn't make any sense at all. And it impacts the quality of health insurance and the quality of medical care that people yeah. receive. And you're so saying- about what, what, one more point about, the, uh, Sorry, yeah. about this provision of the tax code. What it ends up meaning is when I say we let our employer control that dollar, that's not just $1. That's about four uh, out of our $4 trillion health sector. That is a that is $1 trillion, a quarter of all U.S. health spending that the government compels us to let our employers control um, uh, and requires us to uh, uh, enroll in lousy health insurance on pain of this 33% penalty. All right. Is it worth it, though? I mean, um, I, I understand that if you get a, a sort of discount of 33%, you would be willing to accept uh, a, a, a lot of lousiness or whatever you, you, whatever you called it. But uh, wouldn't, I, I would also imagine that some people would go, that's, that's, that's silly. I want a, a solid health insurance that's not tied to my employer. I'll just pay. I'll just pay the extra premium. Well, and some people do. Some people prior to 
2020 or 2014, when the federal government and President Obama created the what we call the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Prior to then, uh, a lot of people uh, either turned down their employer-sponsored insurance or uh, worked for an employer who did not offer health insurance and then purchased insurance directly from insurance companies. Right. And what okay. economists have found is when they did that, and they had to pay a penalty to do it, that 33% penalty. Yeah. When they did that, their odds of being sick, ending up sick and uninsured were lower than if they stayed in an employer plan, because if you're in an employer plan and you are in poor health, you're more likely to end up uninsured than if you bought insurance directly from an insurance company. Ironically, rather than fix the problem, fix the kind of insurance that was throwing people out uh, uh, and leaving them uninsured, uh, sick and uninsured, uh, the President Obama and Congress uh, completely I would, some would say uh, reformed, I would say destroyed the part of the market that had been working, that was providing that more secure coverage. Okay. But wouldn't there be uh, a selection bias there? I mean, those who leave their employer's insurance and go it on their own would tend to be a certain kind of person, maybe who would be less likely to be sick for some reason. And, and it isn't, how, how do you control for selection bias there? So uh, there in the market that existed uh, before the Affordable Care Act, insurance companies in the United States, and, and in some ca cases they can do this now, but insurance companies in the United States used to be able to underwrite. They used to be able to ask you questions about your health and charge you higher premiums if you charge you low premiums if you were healthy and higher premiums if you were sick. And uh, that is how that's the main way they dealt with selection bias that encouraged people to buy insurance when they were healthy and not wait until they're sick because the premiums might be higher or they might not get insurance at all. OK, so and, so this study uh, you're talking about actually controls for that, uh, for, 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 for selection bias. It's, the, it's the like, study that to the extent that it's possible, they're comparing like with like. And, and it this, is, it's actually the, the insurance that's causing uh, oh, yes, yes. That there's a causal effect. It's the insurance that's better, and therefore they're more likely to be healthy and insured. Uh, it's not because they were those who picked that insurance uh, from the start are more, are more healthy, which would be likely. Correct, except that uh, uh, correct that they were controlling for health. Okay. Uh, so it was not driven by that sort of selection or by health effects. If you were in poor health in this plan versus poor health in that plan, you were more likely to end up uninsured if you were in an employer plan than if you purchased insurance directly from an insurance company. So they did control for health. Now, okay. whether it's causal or not, that's a little trickier, but there is a correlation. It looks causal. Let's put it that way. It does. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's very interesting. So, um, so that's how we get from the fifty percent up to the eighty-three that, percent. Yes. That's that's what you mean by com compulsory compulsory spending. And yes. um, I assume that another thing that happens then is that if there's you know because there's this um, uh, tax uh, exemption, politicians also uh, feel entitled to intervene a lot. Uh, I, I assume that there's a lot of regulation of the employer uh, given in, uh, health insurances. There is, but there's really two kinds of, uh, of government intervention that have happened as a result of that implicit tax penalty on people who want to control their own health decisions. There, there's the first kind, which I think you are driving at, which is when the government creates this tax preference, it then wants to impose conditions on that tax preference uh, because it has ideas about how oh, to make employer-sponsored insurance better. Yeah, and that's that really hasn't been much of that in the way of taxes. Uh, there has been uh, or or conditions that the government places on that tax preference or the preferred tax status of employer-sponsored insurance. There's some, but not much. Much, much more of a problem it, uh, it, are the, is, that, is a second category of government interventions, which is where the government intervenes to try to fix all of the problems that it created with this first intervention, that tax penalty. Okay. Yeah. 
I already mentioned one of them, which is Medicare. The, the U.S. Medicare program, the largest purchaser of healthcare in the world, is really just a response to government failure, to the unintended, to the government trying to fix the unintended consequences of a bad, of a previous bad decision that it made. But that's not the only thing, certainly not by a long shot, that government in the United States has had to do to fix the problems that government created with that, what we call tax exclusion for employer-sponsored health insurance. Right. It also created the Medicaid program, as I've mentioned, that's for low-income people. Mm. The tax exclusion also drives up healthcare prices. It drives up healthcare prices in the United States. It drives up healthcare utilization. So quantity and price both go up. Those drive up the price of health insurance because if the prices are higher, then you, uh, you're you spending more on health insurance. And because it makes encourages people to buy more comprehensive health insurance, for all of these reasons, health insurance prices go up as well. And that's the main reason you have the affordability problem in the United States, where we spend so much of our GDP, so much per capita on health care. It's because the government is literally forcing us to spend more and more on health care and spend it in a way that drives up prices and health insurance premiums. OK, let's go a little bit more into that, because I'm not, I'm not okay. sure I'm fully understanding uh, that issue. So in the U.S., you spend about 18 percent of GDP on Healthcare, which is a lot more. Denmark is at ten now. It's actually gone up quite a lot. We are around ten now, ten percent of GDP. Uh, but eighteen—that's that's, that's a, you know that's almost twice as much. Um, and I think and it's worth mentioning that fourteen percent of that is compulsory. Fourteen percentage points of that eighteen percentage points is compulsory spending. The government is requiring us to yeah, spend. Yeah. So so that's that's part of what I'm talking about here. And it's of a GDP per capita, which is uh, you know quite a bit larger than than the, the, Dan, the Danish, uh, the average American is richer than the average Dane. So in, in many ways, it's more expensive. So, um, and you, you're saying, many Danes think the reason why uh, it's so expensive is that it's a, a free market system. It's that, that is not efficient. Uh, you get all these uh, insurance companies that are arguing about price with hospitals and therefore you get a lot of lawyers and there's a lot of bureaucracy. Um, um, there's also a, a question of uh, legal fees for malfeasance and all that. Uh, um, and and, and all, all this stuff is going on and therefore it gets very expensive. But you, but you're telling a different story. What's what is your story again? Go, go a little bit more into detail there. So the efficiency, the inefficiency that we see in the U.S. health sector, whether it is excessive prices, whether it is high uh, or or excessive levels of coverage and excessive utilization, whether it is high administrative costs or low quality care, because a lot of medical care that American patients receive is low quality and even harmful care. Whatever, whichever these we're talking about, those are not the result of market forces. Those are, those are the result of government interventions that encourage those sorts of efficiencies. I'm sorry, inefficiencies. So let's give take me a couple prices. of examples. Yeah. We've been talking about this tax preference for employer-sponsored health insurance. When the government creates that implicit penalty on uh, or, or the, um, you controlling your own health insurance, uh, it's it's or that thirty three percent tax preference for employer sponsored health insurance. It distorts the after tax price of health insurance, which uh, relative to other things, which may if you want, which makes consume cons, want to consume more health insurance because if I could spend a dollar. If I, if I take this dollar as health insurance, I get a dollar's worth of health insurance. But if I take it as cash wages, I only get 67 cents of bubble gum or pizza or whatever else. Right. So that causes people to purchase more, demand more health insurance than they would otherwise. And when they demand more health insurance and are more heavily insured, they demand more medical care than they would otherwise because, more, because their insurance company is bearing more of the cost. So they consume more, demand curves slope downward. They also care less about prices. So quanti because it's someone else's money. So this tax preference is causing the quantity of health insurance, the quantity of uh, medical care that we consume, and the prices for those, uh, for both, mm. all to rise. 
But it's causing it's, all those to rise inefficiently, and this is not the result of market forces. This is government intervention. You said it's someone else's uh, money. It's not really, but it looks like someone else's money. Isn't that the problem? The way I understand it, uh, people feel that it's the employer paying the insurance, mm -hmm. but really it is it is you. Uh, I mean, you're you're getting a lower salary because the your employer has the, the, the employer looks at the total cost of having an employee. That's right. And, and uh, if there was if there was no health insurance that the employer had to pay, and you're paying it out of your own wages, you would be getting a higher salary at uh, from the employer. So That's it, right. is, it is really you paying that uh, insurance cost. But to to the actual employer, it doesn't feel that way, especially not in the uh, in a, a situation where you know a health issue occurs. But but you know also in terms of you know what 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 should this insurance cover and uh, how expensive should it be? It feels like well it's it's my employer paying for this. Uh, That's right. So, so there's no downward pressure on prices from the consumer. Is is that the way? That's correct. And then this this works in a number of ways. It works out in a number of ways. I always try to be careful to say that the cost of employer sponsored health insurance is not salient uh, to. Right. to workers or they don't bear the cost in a salient way or if their if their employer plan uh, negotiates savings by excluding an expensive hospital from their network the, that savings is going to come back to the worker as higher wages or other compensation but that is not salient to the worker because right. it's so attenuated they uh, they don't recognize the savings in a way they would if they were choosing their own health insurance plan. But the, the broader point you're making is that uh, it's not the employer who bears the cost of employer sponsored health benefits. It's the worker. It's the worker because they're getting a dollar of health benefits instead of a dollar of cash wages. And on the uh, for an individual worker, this is just a dollar. If you have family coverage, the average family plan uh, in the United States that's that workers get through an employer, we're, we're talking about uh, your employer controlling $16,000 of your compensation. Wow. And if you want to control that $16,000 yourself, the government penalizes you. You lose about five more than $5,000 of it. That's why so many people let their employers control that much of their, their earnings. And across all employer or across all workers, it adds up to real money. As I mentioned before, we're talking one trillion dollars of their earnings that, that workers don't get to control because the government penalizes them if they want to control it. Right. If they're spending that money themselves, they would be much more careful about how they spend it. Prices would not be as high. Uh, utilization would not be as high. Uh, they would not buy insurance that it is as comprehensive as they demand from their employers because they would see the savings of purchasing less comprehensive coverage, so they would naturally gravitate toward less comprehensive coverage. Okay. It's the so, government intervention here that's driving up the prices. So could and you give me spending. a couple of examples of um you say comprehensive. That sounds like a good thing to have a comprehensive insurance. You know, okay, if you if you get ill, you you do want your insurance to cover. Could you give me a couple examples of of uh, um, you know of too much insurance of, of insurance, oh absolutely insurance covering things that shouldn't be covered. Absolutely. So uh, back in the uh, 1970s, 1980s, there was this enormous. Uh, uh, it, experiment that researchers in the United States did called the Rand Health Insurance Experiment. They assigned people to 100% uh, coverage. So free medical care, quote, put that in quotation fingers, free medical care. They assigned other people to health insurance with various levels of co-insurance, co-payments, including people who had insurance with a very high deductible. What they found was compared to the people who had a very high deductible, the people who had the comprehensive, the, the, the first dollar coverage, the 100% coverage, those people consumed about one third more medical care, but that additional medical care did not make them healthier. That it, it was pure waste. So if there is such a thing as too much health insurance, because you're losing, when you have that sort of uh, the coverage that, that, that is that comprehensive, 
you're spending, you, you end up spending a lot of money on medical care for zero benefit. And you don't mind spending it because on average, healthcare is beneficial. So you think it maybe it's helping, but you're actually wasting a lot of societal resources on medical care that is not helping you in any way. In it, fact, that result surprises me a little bit because surprised a lot of people. Money, money costs are not the only costs that you have for using healthcare. I mean, you're, you're spending your time. Mm -hmm. uh, you might get, you know, bad results uh, from the treatment. Uh, there might be uh, uh, side effects, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, but, uh, you know, first of all, you're spending your time. You have to go to, if you don't feel sick, uh, if you don't feel that this is a healthcare uh, service that might make me better, why would people use it? because they believe that on average, medical care is beneficial. And what the Rand Health Insurance Experiment found is the difference in spending between the people who had a catastrophic high deductible health plan and people who had uh, health care with, with, uh, uh, that was 100% covered, was they, they went to the doctor in, uh, uh, at the same rates. But what happened once they got to the doctor was different depending on whether they were bearing some of the cost of the care or whether someone else is bearing some of the cost of their care. If they were bearing the, uh, the, some of the cost of their care, they less often consented to the recommendations their doctor made and they less often went to the hospital than the people who had, quote, free medical care. Right. And it was that additional stuff that the doctor recommended that the cost conscious consumers said no to, and the cost unconscious consumers said yes to that provided zero benefit on, on balance provided zero benefit. Some of it might've been beneficial, but to the extent it was beneficial, it was offset by harmful care that those people received. Maybe they got a, a, an avoidable infection in a hospital uh, while they were, had a hospital stay. Maybe they had an adverse reaction to a drug that the doctor recommended. Uh, as you say, there are lots of costs to medical care, and some of them are you know, that the medical care might harm you. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, I'm thinking about you know comparing the U.S. to Denmark, and in, ma in many ways, what you're describing there with this system is uh, similar to what you'd expect from a tax finance system. After all, if mm -hmm. I'm a voter and a taxpayer, and I go to the doctor, I would think of the care as free, I would be wanting more than than what I would be wanting if I was paying out of pocket, because somebody else is paying. And you would expect the same kind of upward push on 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 prices uh, in Denmark as in the US. So uh, one question is, why? Why don't you see that? Why? Why don't you see the same? Why aren't the European systems as expensive as the American? Why, why is the upward pressure on prices higher in the U.S. than in Europe? Do you, have you thought about that? Sure, sure. There's a number of reasons. One of them is the United States is, is uh, a wealthier country. Healthcare is a luxury good. So even if there were not these government interventions, we'd probably be spending more on medical care than, uh, than less affluent countries, just because that's how the economics of it work. But as I mentioned before, even though the United States has the government in the United States has as much power when it comes to health care as governments in other countries do, it makes different decisions with those the, with, with that power. Uh, I mentioned the tax preference for employer sponsored insurance. That is an open ended distortion of people's uh, of the 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 economic decisions of workers and employers that at every margin just keeps pushing them to consume more medical care and not to and to care less about prices. So right there, uh, I, I think that's very different from what a lot of countries do. If you look at other countries, Canada, the UK, and you could speak to Denmark better than I could, they don't have this open-ended encouragement of more uh, uh, consumption and cost unconsciousness. Uh, if you look at the Medicare program and the Medicaid program in the United States, which together uh, add up to almost half of U.S. health spending, these are uh, government programs with no fixed budget. They, uh, Canada, the U.K., they will cap the amount that the government spends on medical care. In the United States, the government doesn't do that. 
In the United States, the government says to the states that run the Medicaid program, whatever you spend is fine. We will match it. We will keep spending more and more money. Uh, we'll keep throwing money at you. Yeah. Uh, so oh, whatever benefits you offer and whatever the doctor and the patient agree to, we will cover it. No caps. In the Medicare program, largely the same thing. In the Medicare program, the government writes checks to doctors directly to doctors and hospitals. They do that for about 40 percent of Med oh, I'm sorry, 60 percent of Medicare enrollees. And they impose practically zero limit on the amount of care, the, the amount of medical care that Medicare enrollees can receive, that doctors can demand and, and, um, and ask Medicare to pay for. You have these instead of placing a cap that might keep health spending in the United States below 18, 14, uh, 12% of GDP, we have these open-ended encouragements. Uh, I should say we, I hate saying we, I should not say that. <laughs> I should say government. Government creates these open-ended encouragements for people to consume more and more and more medical care, to drive uh, quantity and price higher and higher and higher. And that is why we end up with the highest share of GDP. No, that's not why we end up with the highest share of GDP spent on health. It, that is why it's so, so much higher than it otherwise would be. And we're so far ahead of other countries where government has uh, as much power over healthcare. It's because those governments make different decisions. They yes. actually use budgets, whereas yeah. we don't. Yeah. And uh, it, it, in in Denmark, we have a system where we have the general pr practitioner as a gatekeeper. So usually, people, if they feel ill or something's wrong, they, they go to they call their their general pr practitioner. They uh, get an appointment, or, you know, speak to them on the phone, and the GP decides what needs to be done. And 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 they serve as a gatekeeper, and they are actually quite strict. They know that there are limited resources in the system, and. They, they 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 get a bad standing with with the, the doctors at the hospital if they send patients unnecessarily to them. Uh, why isn't that that kind of ethical uh, standard among doctors in the U.S. Or, or don't you have a gatekeeper like that? So it depends on what part of the health sector you're talking about. Right. There should be you know in a market system you would have uh, doctors operating under different incentives some of which would encourage them to play more of a gatekeeper role and say no more often or just be more cautious. And others would encourage them to, other systems would encourage them to recommend more care. And then those different systems would compete to see who ends up, which systems end up offering patients the right level of care, the amount of care the patient wants without, uh, you know, without bankrupting the patient or, or, or making them pay for unwanted care. The problem in the United States is we do have some of those gatekeeper physicians that you're talking about in the Veterans Health Administration, in the uh, health plan that I mentioned, Kaiser Permanente, and in some similar health plans where, uh, where you don't have incentives to just consume more and more and more, where this, those systems operate on incentives that make the, the physicians more conservative, more cautious, more parsimonious. They exist in the United States, but only in select pockets. Elsewhere, what's happening in, in the United States for the most part is that for all the reasons I mentioned, government is encouraging more and more and more medical care. And those incentives trickle down to the level of the individual physician. And what ends up happening is medical care, healthcare is an incredibly complex yeah. uh, endeavor. There's tremendous uncertainty about what the patient has, what the patient needs. Um, and e even doctors don't know as much as they want to know about, about healthcare. And in the midst of all of that uncertainty, if you, when you create incentives for doctors to do more, they will respond to that uncertainty by doing more. And that's what the US government does. And so that's why doctors in the United States don't play the same gatekeeper role they might play in other countries or even in those pockets of the health sector where they are more, where doctors are more conservative. It's because the government is creating incentives that encourage them to respond to the uncertainty in medical care by doing more and more and more. And there's actually a lot of evidence on this from the US Medicare program, where similar to the Rand Health Insurance experiment, researchers have found that 
because of the incentives Medicare creates to do more and more and more, about one third of Medicare spending does absolutely nothing to benefit the patient. It is pure waste, a pure transfer of money from taxpayers to healthcare providers that does nothing for the patient along the way. Mm -hmm. That's all because the, the government is encouraging doctors to respond to the inherent uncertainty in medicine by doing more and more and more to the point where the more isn't helping. Okay. Okay. So um, I, I read somewhere that um, there is a problem with lack of competition in the system uh, along uh, several different uh, parameters. So one thing I've read, I'm not sure about this, is that the insurance providers do not face uh, strong competitions among them because because they 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 cannot move beyond the the state border is that correct they they cannot move right. to, to a different state so so you don't have an internal market in the US for health insurance uh not a national one we have 50 different markets you know how but, crazy that sounds to me <laughs> oh do you know how crazy it sounds to me so so i have a paper coming out on the it's very issue of inefficient consolidation in healthcare markets. And there are all sorts of causes of this, that uh, 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 all sorts of uh, things the government does to discourage competition in healthcare and encourage consolidation, oligopolization, monopolization. But let, let uh, me just ask you, uh, so you're a libertarian, so you, you, are, you believe that the federal government shouldn't intervene uh, in, in state issues, uh, I assume. In, but but how, how do you see this uh, p particular problem in the European Union, we got an internal market by by Brussels, sort of imposing rules on the different countries and saying you need to be more open to uh, you know uh, goods and services moving across borders because otherwise it's protectionism and we need an internal market. What's your take on this in the US? How should this be, be solved? So this is a this is a debate among libertarians because there is no clear libertarian answer. You know, it's the, it's the Brexit debate. Should yeah. what is going to guarantee liberty and free markets and prosperity better? A giving power to a central authority that may create rules that are um, that guarantee more freedoms than individual polities within that. Uh, within its ambit might guarantee uh and or should we decentralize and let the individual policies make bad policies uh a lot of people were concerned about immigration restrictions in uh, in the uk should we let them impose stricter immigration restrictions and then uh and then hopefully learn from the ill effects of those restrictions that that's a bad idea uh so that it changes the political um, uh, the political dynamics of that issue in the UK, and they eventually scrapped those uh, immigration restrictions. I'm not really sure which is the best uh, approach. I, I lean toward decentralization. Okay. Because I think the, the, the accountability loops are tighter. Uh, but, uh, but here in the United States, the national government does have the power under the Constitution to tear down the barriers to a national market and health insurance that you mentioned, the state laws that prevent insurers from selling the same product in multiple states. Okay. Uh, and, and I would, and and even though I favor decentralization, God, I would really, really love to see the national government use that power. Well, if it's constitutional, I, I, I guess. Uh, as a if it's constitutional, right. right. <laughs> But you're also smiling and looking away there, so <laughs> it's yeah because it's a it's yeah I, I do feel a little guilty. <laughs> but let's uh, move a little bit into that. So, uh, to what extent do you think health insurance would be cheaper if that competition uh, across state borders was there? Um, do you think it's significant? Right now, I mean, the answer depends on you know at, at what point which in state? time and and which states okay. and whether you're counting U.S. territories as well, which I will. If the federal government or if any state allowed residents to purchase insurance from any other state or U.S. territory, health insurance prices would fall by 50, 60, 70 percent for most consumers. What? That's crazy. 
How That's you, not crazy. You, the crazy part is that the government is driving up health insurance premiums by uh, uh, by 200 percent or three or 400 percent. The reason health insurance is so expensive in most markets in the United States, and here I'm talking about, uh, we could talk about the employer market, but here I'm talking about insurance that is available under the Affordable Care Act, which uh, which destroyed the market that had been there before where you could buy insurance directly from an insurance company. So the Affordable but, Care Act, that, that's Obamacare. That's Obamacare. Yeah. It, it made health insurance so affordable that it drove up the prices 200, 300, 400% for many people. It, it's a result of the regulations the Affordable Care Act put in place that health insurance is that expensive for most consumers when if we got rid of those regulations, the price of health insurance could fall by 50, 60, 70 percent. And they, any state could do that right now by allowing their residents to purchase insurance from U.S. territories like Puerto Rico, Guam, uh, American Samoa, the U.S. Virgin Islands, if if they uh, if they let their residents purchase insurance licensed by any U.S. territory, their residents could avoid all of Obamacare's regulate worst regulations, and the price of their health insurance would drop. Okay, that could actually make Obamacare work better. But the people who put Obamacare in place want to force everyone into it. Think they think that's the way to make Obamacare work. Yeah. And so they're not letting people people do that. Sometimes this is a side issue. Sometimes I wonder if when people on the left and politicians use force, if that's the mean the means or, or the end in itself. You know? <laughs> Did you know what I mean? It, uh, it, there... it's, it's it's as if it's it, it's the idea of using force in itself that's so they, they so gleefully love that. Uh, you know, is it? Uh, one does wonder if that is the reason sometimes. Yeah. Anyway, because that, that, the, that, the, the effects, the, the effects are so, so contrary to the stated aims of these of this sort of economic regulation, whether it's whether it's the Medicare program, the Medicaid program, Obamacare, uh, the Veterans Health Administration, whatever the government is doing in healthcare, the people who are, are advancing that that idea are always talking about better and more affordable and more secure healthcare, and they're always delivering exactly the opposite. So, Each one of those interventions is making healthcare more expensive and reducing the quality of care, uh, and yet the people who uh, advocate those ideas just keep charging, blazing forward. Intentions matter more to them than results. Uh, so we're talking about insurance companies. Are there other areas where comp where lack of competition in the U.S. Uh, is causing prices to be higher or healthcare to be worse than it otherwise could be? Uh, competition between hospitals, doctors, and nurses, or med prices of medicine, stuff like that? All of these things. So uh, uh, hospital consolidation in the United States is a growing problem. Consolidation among physician practices is a, is a growing problem. And in markets where you have more consolidation, uh, prices end up higher, quality ends up lower. And But is that a market failure? Why, why is there no competition? You're saying consolidation. So there, That's as I mentioned, as I mentioned, there, there, uh, there's a long list of things the government is doing to encourage consolidation, regulation generally, and not just healthcare regulation, but labor or, or environmental, any kind of regulation, is going to make, uh, is going to increase the incentives for inefficient consolidation, just because the fixed costs of regulation are high, but the marginal cost of complying with regulation is low. So, so anytime two companies in the same industry merge, they're saving on regulatory compliance costs. Right, and that that makes uh, that creates an incentive for every inefficient consolidation in every sector, but in healthcare in particular. There are also um, uh, lots of discrete or healthcare specific regulations that encourage consolidation, some in the Affordable Care Act, some elsewhere. There are specific laws that states create that seem designed to encourage consolidation. In about 20 uh, or 30 states, you need permission from the government in order to open a new hospital or to invest in new equipment or to enter healthcare markets in other ways. And 
when you need permission from the government to do that, that's a huge barrier to entry that ends up fueling, reducing competition and fueling consolidation. And then one last item, uh, uh, or I'll mention is when the government increases the incentive or, or encourages excessive levels of insurance coverage, that itself encourages consolidation among healthcare providers, because when more providers are purchasing insurance, or, or, or when more pro providers are getting their income th from insurance companies, as opposed to directly from patients, they have even more of an incentive to consolidate, to negotiate better deals from those insurance companies. So consolidation and lack of competition is an increasing problem in the U.S. health sector. It is not the result of market forces. It is not the result of healthcare being special. It is the result of identifiable things that government is doing. Lots, dozens of identifiable things the government is doing to encourage an efficient consolidation and dampen competition. During COVID, I read somewhere that uh, regulations preventing nurses from moving from one state to the other uh, were, uh, you know, t taken away temporarily, I assume, so so that you could deal with, you know, since COVID uh, infections uh, aren't, you know, at, at a high level at the same time in different states, you could sort of utilize nurses better in that way. Mm -hmm. um, what I was thinking is, uh, there's another example of the US not having an internal market. I mean, nurses from Norway and Sweden have worked in Denmark, even before the internal market. Now we have nurses and doctors really moving uh, across borders inside the European Union uh, at, at, you know, okay, significant, obviously there are language issues sometimes, uh, but uh, th there's a lot of that going on. You we don't do have ha the language issue. Uh, you have it. Uh, not, 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 not like you do. <laughs> we have internal markets though in the United States, but, 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 but like for clinicians, doctors, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, dentists, dental therapists, and so forth. But the problem is we have uh, we don't have a national market because each state creates barriers to entry into their market. So we have 50 different markets. And you know who are the biggest proponents of those barriers? It's yeah. the doctors I'll, I'll and the nurses yeah. Yeah. because they don't want competition from doctors and nurses in other states. So whenever you try to liberalize these rules, whenever you try to lower those barriers, the doctors are the ones who complain the most, even though the doctors in other states are going to the same medical schools and passing the same tests and would have to face the same medical malpractice liability yeah. that uh, that they would. So so same training, same accountability. Uh, they say, no, we don't want them to come in because they, and it's because they don't like the competition. All right. Is that pushing up uh, wages? Yeah. It, it drives up prices for for doctors, for nurse practitioners, for all of the regulated professions, mm. and um, and they like it that way. Now, what one interesting thing about COVID was, you had uh, you had governors and um, legislatures, mostly governors from all from various different states, in various parts of the country, and for both political parties, who were suspending those restrictions on out-of-state clinicians because they recognize two things. One, we are in dire straits right now. We need help. Like New York was a hot spot for, uh, of COVID infections for some time and their, their, their clinicians and their hospitals were overwhelmed. Uh, so we need the help. And two, these laws are a barrier to access to care. So we need to suspend these laws. It was an admission that the government, a bipartisan admission, that government is restricting access to care by restricting the free flow of, uh, of uh, medical human capital across state borders. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. But that, that's, that's, that's the way it is. And I, I assume that it's, one of the reasons why it's very hard to do something about this em employer in insurance thing um, is that these insurance companies are very powerful as well uh, now, by now. I mean, they, they've become a sort of entrenched insider in, in the sector. Uh, th this has been going on since World War II, I believe, uh, uh, th this, this buildup of a, a private employer insurance-based uh, uh, health insurance. So uh, there's there's this myth. Uh, speaking, of, we began with a couple of myths. 
here's another one yeah. that we should shatter that that big government and big business are enemies that they're always fighting with each other that's not the case at all big mm -hmm. business loves big government because big government protects business from competition and subsidizes business they love when the government does that and the biggest obstacle to reform uh, of the health sector in the united states is the businesses who are making tons of money off of the government the ways the government is intervening right now and insurance companies are are some of the worst culprits here hospitals drug companies are also bad but insurance companies are some of the worst culprits people think that the insurance companies opposed obamacare they didn't oppose obamacare obamacare re required people to purchase their products they loved it when i and when i was speaking to an insurance company lobbyist recently about maybe coming and speaking to their group uh, about some of the issues that i had been working on i sent this lobbyist a paper i had written about eliminating that tax preference for employer-sponsored insurance and this lobbyist said absolutely not you are not going to come to our event and make that argument because we love that tax preference for employer sponsored insurance why as we discussed before it encourages workers to demand more coverage more comprehensive coverage means higher premiums higher premiums means more revenue for the insurance companies right. Right. so they they are one of the biggest obstacles to letting to a free market in the United States and a, a, a free market that lets workers control their own healthcare dollars and control their health insurance decisions. That is not what the insurance industry wants. No. So many people looking at that debate from Denmark would see, okay, the private healthcare insurances are the obstacle to reform because they want to keep the free market system in the US that doesn't work and, and prevent the creation of a wonderful universal system like we have in Denmark. Uh, but that's what you what you just described is that's not at all the case. They are really a part of, of a, a, a kind of pseudo government uh, regulated system. And they're not financed by directly by taxpayer money, but it's it's very similar. It's compulsory spending uh via via employers and it's and it's it's government uh subsidized and whenever you have government wielding these sorts of powers you run the risk of and it's usually more than just a risk of uh of, of those powers falling under the control of the industry that makes the most money off of those government activities we call it regulatory capture yeah. where the where the regulated industry or the subsidized industry captures control of those powers that we've given to government and i got news for you it, it doesn't just happen in the united states it happens in uh the uk where uh where lobbyists for healthcare workers hold tremendous sway over the national health service uh, i'm sure it happens in denmark as well where healthcare workers hold tremendous uh hold tremendous sway over the decisions that the government makes uh public, affecting public, their livelihoods public sector unions uh, public uh, sector uh, unions i wasn't the, yeah i wasn't sure if they were unionized in, in denmark but they they wield tremendous power over these decisions and it and it makes sense because they are the people with the biggest finance immediate financial stake uh in these decisions patients have you know their lives are on the line but that's often uncertain about whether it's their life that's yeah. going to be on the line okay. so they're harder to organize than the people who are making their livelihood off of these decisions. And then these systems end up serving not the patients, the, the idealistic creators of these systems what might have wanted them to serve. They end up serving the, uh, the industry itself. And whether it's the public sector unions in uh, in in, uh, in Denmark or elsewhere or the UK, or it's the health insurance industry uh, and the hospitals in the United States, or doctors in the United States as well, although they don't unionize. Uh, the the system ends up serving them rather than the patients that we want the system to serve. Right. Okay, so um, what would be your ideal free market system? Uh, I'm asking because there. I, we need to acknowledge that it, it is tricky to create a, a, a market that works. And it, it, it's actually, it's tricky to create any market. Markets sort of emerge. Uh, and, and if they've been destroyed, it's hard to get back to a market that's well-functioning. Uh, and also, we, we need to recognize that there are uh, 
issues of market failure uh, in, in, in healthcare. So there's asymmetric information. If you're paying out of pocket, doctors might try and persuade you that, that you need treatment you don't need. Uh, if, if they profit from that, uh, there is, uh, if you have insurance companies, there's the problem of cream skimming or, you know, telling, uh, you know, how, how do you make sure that, that people who are born with illnesses or, or who have, are chronically sick that they can get insurance, uh, you know, all kinds of issues like that. Could you talk a little bit about how would you solve those kinds of market problems in a, in a free market system? Would it be government regulation of some kind of, how would you do that? I think first we need to take a step back right. and, and decide what is our goal going to be for health policy. Are we going to create a health system that is absolutely perfect, where absolutely no one goes without the medical care that they need, where absolutely no one falls through the cracks? If that is your goal, if you think that is attainable, if you think that humans, fallible human beings, will be able to achieve that sort of perfection, I suggest you might want to sit this one out. Sit out this debate because you're as likely to be misled and do more harm as you are to do any good. And that's, we, we sorry, have to, sorry for, for uh, interrupting here, but, but uh, um, this, the, the problem here is, is um, the Nirvana fallacy, isn't it? Uh, exactly. A lot of people who are skeptical of a free market solution will say, well, wouldn't that create a system where not everyone gets ex the exact treatment that would be the best for them? And of course, you and I would say, well, um, that's no we system, <laughs> every system does yeah. that. Yeah, we, we, we get one case after the other in Denmark of, um, you know, very uh, terrible and tragic uh, treatment of patients that, you know, went horribly wrong. That happens in, in any system. And when people come to me or to you with these questions, usually what's happening is they're having a very emotional reaction to some horrific uh, episode that they've, yeah. they've read about or that they've witnessed maybe in their personal lives. And they want reassurance from me or from you that whatever you're going to do is going to make sure that doesn't happen. Right. But can you and, but, and, but can, and, it, and and but we as policymakers, we need to address those. But if we want to if we want to um, advise policymakers on how to make sure that happens least. Not just in this one instance, but how if we want to minimize unmet medical need as much as possible, we have to recognize, first of all, that it that that there is no nirvana here. There is no perfect health system. Human beings are fallible. There will always be people falling through the cracks. And we need to we need to set as our goal, not nirvana, but what it what kind of health system will minimize the number of people who fall through the cracks and not just minimize them today, but keep developing innovations that fill in those cracks so that fewer and fewer people fall through over time. And when you're engaged in that kind of an effort, you can't just look at the margin that you're you know, the person who's challenging you is asking you to look at, you have to look at all of the margins. You have to look at all of the patients, including patients for whom the, the, there are no treatments right now to make sure that we're still generating those sorts of innovations that will fill in those cracks in our health sector. And, and the, the, the case, the reason I may, uh, uh, the reason I support a free market in healthcare well, there's two reasons. First is that it's it's morally correct. You have a right to make your own health decisions and a right to control that includes the right to control your own income. And no one else has a right to take those decisions away from you. Uh, but in addition to that, even if you don't believe in that rights business, in, in addition to that, uh, a free market does the best job of filling in those cracks so that fewer and fewer people fall through over time of generating the sort of innovations that make healthcare better today than it was yesterday. They make it more affordable today than it was yesterday. And that make access to care more secure so that health insurance is better. With all those sorts of innovations, you fill in the cracks in uh, in the health sector over time so that fewer and fewer people fall through. I would never say that no one is going to fall through the cracks of the health sector, 
but the great advantage of a free market is it does a better job than any other system that we could devise. But what because does it- whether whether it's a Danish system, the U.S. system, British, Canadian, those systems are causing those cracks to widen and causing more and more people to fall through over time. But what and would you often, look often like, people are, to play, are, are, are blaming that on markets. Yeah. So what that system would look like is, is uh, you have two parts freedom and one part government. The first part freedom is you would let, you would let the consumer control the money. Right now, in the in the data system, in the in the U.S. system, government is controlling about eighty three percent of the money. The system is not going to serve consumers unless they control the money. Any economic system will serve the people who control the money. That's that's how that's how humans work. So first, you need to let them control the money, and you can read you can still redistribute if you want. You can, but you need to yeah, redistribute yeah, 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 yeah. income to people in the form of cash. So that you're not taking away their control over their their health decisions. Mm. So that's number one. You know, the consumers control the money. Two, you remove barriers to entry. And controlling uh, and, the money means that that you can buy your insurance or you can pay out of pocket, and you decide yourself. You decide whether and how much ins- health insurance to buy. Both you whether, decide both whether and how much. Yes, because so if I, you, I can say I don't want any insurance. Yes. Okay. Because if that is that is essential to the function to a well functioning health insurance market, if the government re- requires you to buy health insurance, the government has to define health insurance. That means, means the government is going to be imposing rules on the health insurance market that are going to inhibit the sort of innovations that fill in the cracks in the health sector. Okay. Those rules are going to be captured by the insurance industry, who are going to use them to block competition from new innovative plans that fill in those cracks. But so, a, but let, let me just challenge that. Uh, I'm not sure that would be possible politically in Denmark, uh, and maybe it, it now you didn't ask me that. You asked me <laughs> what was my ideal system. No, but I'm not talking about getting there. I'm talking about even if we were there, I think that wouldn't be a stable uh, outcome because um, if I decide not to have any insurance, well, maybe not me, but someone, uh, and that person then falls sick, something terrible happens, and and. Uh, he he's on television and saying okay i'm i'm going to die if i don't get any treatment uh i i think there would be pressure towards saying we can't let that happen that's unacceptable we need the government to step in and help people like that and then there'll be an incentive not to be insured and then there'll be a debate about that and then there, there'll be okay we need to make it compulsory for people to insure so that we don't get this uh, moral hazard or whatever you you'd call it um, and then you end up right back where you were at least you'd need you'd end up you with, can, some, with some kind of compulsion right you can you can you can you can play it out that way but let me uh, let me finish what i was saying about two parts government and one part okay, freedom okay. and the sort of dramatic or two parts freedom and one part government okay. and the dramatic transformation that we would see in the health sector that w- would make that scenario you're talking about have been far less often okay when you let the consumers control the money they are going to be much more p- cost and price conscious than they are right now. And that is going to drive down prices in whether it's the US health sector where prices are higher than maybe anywhere in the world, or even in the Danish health sector, prices are going to fall. And when they fall, that fills in the cracks of the health sector so that more people can afford medical care and fewer people end up in the situation that you're describing. Mm. Also, because it causes the price of health insurance to come down so that more and more people can afford it. And fewer of people end up in the sort of situation you're describing. One thing that facilitates this price uh, competition and falling prices is the second thing, the second part freedom. You remove barriers to entry into the health sector so that people can bring to the market lower cost ways of meeting people's health needs, whether it's delivery of medical care or whether it is health insurance. You make those things uh, uh, removing barriers to entry will make will increase competition, drive down prices while driving up quality, like we see in other sectors of the of the economy. Right. That's going to fill in those cracks even further. Prices falling uh, even further, so that fewer and fewer people end up in the situation you're describing. Uh, the and and prices would fall so much that that not only would fewer people end up in the situation you're describing 
But it would be much easier for the rest of us to provide medical care to the people who either didn't buy health insurance when they had the chance or never had the means to purchase health insurance and are now unable to get the medical care they need. That group of people would be so much smaller than it is today. And we would all be wealthier for, for two reasons. One, because we, we would be uh, spending less money on inflated prices for healthcare, whether it's government provided in you know higher tax price or or, um, or uh, through the private sector. Uh, so we would have more money and the prices we would have to pay to provide healthcare for those people would be lower as well. So again, I'm not going to say that no one would fall through the cracks of the healthcare sector, but it would happen much, much less often than we would imagine living in the health sectors that we live in right now and seeing how they operate. Because with those two parts freedom, the health sector in Denmark or the United States would be dramatically different than what we know right okay. now. So um, I think a lot of people would be listening to you and going, how can it get much cheaper than what it is? This is, I mean, it's nurses, it's doctors, they they are they're treating us they are competent uh and it's it's not like farming where, where you can increase productivity or, or industry where you can increase productivity two percent each year for eternity apparently uh th this is different it, you know you, you, an operation takes the time it takes it's it's like a concert you know it's the boom all uh, thing uh, you know you have a, a, a uh, you have a the, uh, you, you have a symphony orchestra playing Mozart, and you need the orchestra. You need the, the time it takes to play uh, Mozart, uh, whatever symphony we're talking about, ninth, uh, and and that's it. Uh, productivity can't increase. Prices just have to go up. We have to accept the nurses and doctors will need to be paid more in the future, and. Uh, uh, they won't be more productive. It's just going to be, get more and more expensive. And that's that's the nature of healthcare. You're saying the opposite. Uh, I think that attitude is prevalent, but it uh, reflects a lamentable lack of understanding about economics generally and the economics of healthcare in particular. Those sorts of productivity gains can happen. They, they happen all the time, but either government intervention uh, crushes them uh, so prevents them from coming to market, crushes them once they come to market or prevent them from spreading. I'll give you a couple of examples. A surgery might take as much time as a surgery takes, but you can encourage people to, or it is possible to let people with less training perform surgeries uh, if you give them specialized training in performing that surgery. The state of Oregon in the United States recently allowed nurse practitioners to perform vasectomies, a relatively simple procedure. And if you let nurse practitioners do it, that's a lower cost clinician. So you are making vasectomies more affordable. The same sort of thing can happen with other surgeries. Productivity gains can also happen if you can give someone a pill that lets them avoid that surgery. Statins are an example of that. If you uh, give people statins, you uh, uh, reduce cholesterol buildup and reduce adverse cardiac events. Uh, and that is um, that is a tremendous productivity gain that we see in healthcare. Uh, you can see productivity gains in terms of uh, telehealth. It is, if you, you can consult your doctor via Zoom as we are conducting this call, then that dramatically reduces the cost of going to see the doctor, not just the price, the, the, the doctor can charge you less, but uh, because you're probably taking less of, of her time, but also you, you can save a trip across town. These are tremendous productivity gains. These sorts of productivity gains happen in healthcare all the time as uh, the, 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 um, the sector or producer is engaged in what we call right skilling. The nurse practitioners performing vasectomies is an example of right skilling, uh, but pushing tasks down to lower skilled people who are still competent to perform them so that you're driving down the price of healthcare. There are tremendous opportunities for these sorts of productivity gains. Um, in the United States, we, we don't get to capture them because of some of the regulations that we've mentioned, yeah. but also because the Medicare program pays uh, pays nurse practitioners physician prices for performing those services. And so ends up overcharging taxpayers uh, and keeping prices high that way. I agree with you. Uh, 
And I think there's, there's another uh, issue here uh, and reason why we, I, first of all, we do get productivity increases, but a lot of it is because of new technology. Uh, like, you know, you get new types of scanners that are better. You get new treatments uh, that, that... Not unlike farm equipment. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so you do get a lot of productivity increase, but what you don't get is is the sort of uh, entrepreneurially driven innovation in, in healthcare that that is specifically focused on driving down prices because mm-hmm. the, because there's very little incentive, as you've been, de- been describing, to drive down prices. The incentive is to increase care, to find new treatments to, uh, you know, basically give new services to uh, to consumers who are not price sensitive. Uh, and this is exactly why you don't want a government guarantee yeah. of access to care, because the moment you do that, you end up with 83, 86 percent compulsory spending. Consumers don't care about prices. And so you don't get that downward pressure on prices that we would get with price conscious consumers. Right. You know, there have been studies in the United States showing that uh, not only has government driven up the prices for things like hip and knee replacements, but making consumers cost conscious can drive down those prices by 30 percent in two years uh, uh, in some cases. Wow. And uh, we, we can see even larger price reductions, uh, but we need to, uh, but not when 83 or 86 percent of spending is compulsory. Consumers are never going to care enough about uh, prices to demand lower prices in that sort of an environment. Did you get to the one third that was uh, government? Uh, oh, right. So that's just that's stuff that we can all agree on where the government should be enforcing contracts and and, and operating a medical malpractice system to uh, to uh, to force uh, health care providers who injure their patients through negligence to make those patients whole, which will then encourage them to practice better, safer, higher quality medicine and then some public health measures, although that's certainly tremendously been tremendously controversial. Uh, but I, I, I can even see a role for government in some public health measures. Uh, you do need some government, but the government really doesn't need to play a special role in healthcare. And to the extent it does, mm-hmm. it's going to cause those cracks in the healthcare sector to widen and cause more people to fall through. And what about the issues I mentioned? Uh, asymmetric information, profit, uh, uh, you know, uh, profit-driven, profit-motivated uh, hospitals or doctors. Uh, uh, persuading uh, ignorant uh, consumers to to, to take uh, uh, you know healthcare services that are needed. Um, uh, that's that's let's take that one first. So all of those problems are present in the health sector, no matter who controls the money. If government is running the healthcare sector, there's still going to be problems of asymmetric information. The 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 question, there's no nirvana here that makes those problems go away. The question is, which system does the best job of dealing with that information asymmetry? Is it a system where the government is making uh, most of the decisions and the industry ends up capturing the government and keeping things the way they are so there's no innovation and we end up spending more and more than we need to for lower quality care than we could otherwise get? Or do you want a a health sector where the consumers are controlling the money? And in order to get that money, producers have to compete to see who can overcome these problems the best. The problem of asymmetric information, for example. If and of course there there are market solutions as well to asymmetric information. Well, that's what I'm getting at. That's what I'm driving at. Sorry. If if the if the um, if there are if there's one doctor or or hospital or health system that is exploiting the information in asymmetry that exists between them and patients, selling patients on more care than they need, that is a profit opportunity for another health system to enter that market and steal those steal market share from that first system by offering patients by, by not exploiting that information asymmetry, by offering patients only the medical care that they need. That new system will profit because they will be able to capture that market share. The patients will profit because they will be spending less money on healthcare and be exposed to less potentially dangerous mm-hmm. medicine. And, and, and there you go. And so I've often also answered your profit motive question. The profit motive 
is actually a boon to patients because it helps to overcome these problems, but only if the patients are the ones controlling the money and deciding which system gets to profit. If they're the ones controlling the money, they will decide that the system that gets a profit is the one that is benefiting me. And that I think if that's the standard, no one's going to have an objection to profits in healthcare if profits are a measure uh, uh, of how much producers are help, helping patients. Another way of dealing with asymmetric information is to have one uh, entity uh, advising you, but not profiting from the actual mm -hmm. uh, treatment. So, so if you're paying someone to find out what treatment you need, uh, and that person is being fully remunerated by giving that info that by, by doing that service and then someone else is doing the treatment based on that advice uh I, I guess that's one way of dealing with with asymmetric information right and that's something that you know patients have come up with by themselves getting yeah. second opinions uh and and uh another way of dealing with asymmetric information is the sort of gatekeeper role uh, or what we're discussed to see when you brought the gatekeeper role that many physicians play if you have a health system that pays doctors more and more, the more stuff they do, then they will have incentives to exploit that information asymmetry. But there are other uh, ways of organizing and financing med medicine that creates different incentives that do not exploit information asymmetry. And here I'm talking about, uh, again, Kaiser Permanente, which is a private sector NHS or, uh, or, veter or uh, VA system and they, those doctors are paid on a salary basis. The health system, uh, neither they nor the health system broadly make more money the more services they provide. And so that is another market response to correcting that, correcting that information asymmetry. The problem is we don't have a lot of those systems in the United States because government has blocked those systems at every turn, from licensing of clinicians to licensing of insurance companies to the tax preference from employer sponsor to health insurance to the Medicare program and on and on, government, at the often at the behest of physicians who who don't like that model of uh, paying physicians, have blocked that that market response uh, that market solution to the problem of asymmetric information. All right. What about the other issue I mentioned? Uh, if you have a lot of this would be insurance based because healthcare is sometimes. Uh, is there a problem? No, I uh, I was just looking at things on my screen. Okay, <laughs> uh, a lot of things. Uh, a, a lot of healthcare would would is it would be very very expensive, and it, it would be similar to your house burning down, and you you'd want to make it not out of pocket. Uh, but insurance based. How do you make sure that insurance companies insure uh, bad lives, people who have chronic diseases or uh, who they, um, for some reason, expect to be uh, someone who will have a large, uh, have, have, have large healthcare costs and, and, and therefore be bad customers. So one thing we have to be clear about is what is the nature of insurance? And what makes insurance markets stable and what causes them to collapse? So insurance is the pooling of like risk. And, uh, and if you have a loss that has already occurred, that is not insurable because it's not a risk anymore. It's a certainty. And insurance markets collapse or they become unstable and unsustainable if you try to force them to cover, to, to, to subsidize people who have already suffered a loss. If you think about it in terms of, uh, of, of homeowner's insurance, if you let people wait until after their house burns down to buy homeowner's insurance, nobody's going to buy homeowner's insurance. And there won't be a market for people whose house has not burned down yet. So you will, you'll actually be, uh, you can actually increase human suffering if you try to make insurance markets do that. Same, we could tell a similar story with car insurance. And we can tell a similar story with health insurance. If someone has already suffered a health loss, then their 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 medical condition is a pre-existing condition and by definition uninsurable. The most important thing we can do for people in that situation is, first of all, keep people out of that situation. 
So reduce the number of people in that situation by sure. making health insurance as affordable as possible for people when they are healthy so that when they suffer a health loss, they will already be insured. This, this is where the the U.S. government has fallen down by encouraging people to get employer-sponsored insurance, which disappears after they suffer a health loss and leaves them uninsured and with an uninsurable medical condition. Uh, the, the, next, the next most important thing we can do for people in that situation is we can uh, do what I mentioned before about consu letting consumers control the money and driving down prices, because then even if they end up in that situation and they don't have health insurance, the cost of the medical care they need, the prices that they will have to pay are going or maybe that we're going to have to pay on their behalf are going to be as low as possible. So again, we're, we're filling in the cracks so that fewer and fewer people fall through. And uh, there are also other, it's also important to eliminate barriers to entry into the market to, uh, because a lot of, to the extent you have regulation of health insurance markets, you're going to be blocking innovative products that could help those people. An example is, uh, I've talked a lot about how in the United States, if you lose your health insurance, you lose your job, you lose your health insurance. And if that comes after you've gotten sick, then for a long time, you're out of luck and in some many cases, you're still uh, in pretty dire straits, even with Obamacare. Prior to Obamacare, though, insurance markets in the United States were innovating to try to solve that problem the government created. There was an insurance company that got licensed for sale in 25 states because you got to get permission from the states. Mm -hmm. But license got approved for sale by 25 states, a new product that would cover you if you lost your employer-sponsored insurance. It would allow you to enroll in uh, a, a oh. health insurance plan in what we call the individual health insurance market, where you buy insurance directly from an insurance company. After you lose your employer-sponsored insurance, and they offered this protection against being left with an uninsurable pre-existing condition. They offer that protection for just 20% of the cost of the underlying policy that you would enroll in after you leave your employer plan. And so here you have markets innovating to solve problems the government created in a way that, uh, in a way that nobody could have foreseen and uh, and this is why we want to eliminate barriers to entry into the market as much as possible, because people, you and I cannot imagine no. all of the ideas and innovations that people are going to come up with to solve these problems, the problem you identified of people with expensive conditions without health insurance. And we need to give them maximum latitude to do this because this is so crucially important that we get this right, because there are people's lives on the line, whereas, you know, when government tries to solve these problems, it, ends, it just ends up destroying lives rather than uh, filling in the cracks of our healthcare sector. Okay. You don't see a role for government with uh, people with, uh, pre uh, with chronic uh, diseases uh, who, who don't have insurance? I think that pretty much anything the government could do there is going to cause those cracks to widen rather than fill them in. Okay. So on the one hand, we might be confronted with, the, with, a, with a patient who's unable to obtain the care that she needs. And it's very tempting to have the government come in and subsidize that person, but it's not the government. It's not going to subsidize just that person. It's going to subsidize all these people over here and all these people over there. A lot of them may, maybe didn't need the subsidy. Those subsidies are going to be captured by the industry. The industry is going to uh, bend those subsidies toward their benefit. They're going to hit, they're going to focus on lobbying rather than on innovating. And the net result is going to be that more and more people are going to fall through the cracks than, than if the government did nothing. Okay. Well, let, let's say that I'm 25 and I haven't come around to uh, taking out a, an insurance yet, and, and I'm, I'm diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis or something like that. Mm -hmm. What would I do? So again, uh, I, I, I would I would say that a free market is not going to solve every problem because no system can. There will be people who fall through the cracks. What it would do for that a person in that situation is. First of all, it might help them to wise up and buy health insurance before that happens so that fewer people end up with an MS diagnosis and no health insurance. Okay, so 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 you, you, the society I, would build up but, a strong culture where parents go, okay, you're 18 now, you need to go out and get an insurance because... Uh, you see, you saw what happened to customers, and it would be, and it would be far more affordable than it is right now. As I mentioned, uh, 
in the kind of market that I'm describing, mm. health insurance in the United States would be 50, 60, 70% less expensive for, for most people in, yeah. um, in, in the Obamacare market. Uh, the second thing it would do is, as I mentioned before, it would drive down the prices of the care that this person needs. And it would also uh, make it easier for so maybe this person can afford the, this medical care themselves. Uh, but even if they can't, it would be easier for you and me to help this person through private charitable efforts, GoFundMe pages, and so forth. Yeah. And it's interesting, to, though, that you mentioned multiple sclerosis because there have been studies of Obamacare. You know, Obamacare is an effort to try to solve the problem that you identified. It tries to it tried to force that twenty five year old to buy health insurance. That that mandate is is uh, a dead letter right now. It also tells insurance companies they have to cover him, no matter what, even if he's got MS. Now you would think that that would be a boon to MS patients. But what that same provision did that says you cannot discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions when you're selling them health insurance is it makes health insurance for people with MS worse. In fact, it forces insurance companies to make health insurance for people with MS worse and creates a race to the bottom to see which insurance companies can avoid providing the best coverage to those MS patients. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. And, and that might help. So that might help that one MS patient that you're that you've identified. But there are going to be thousands of other MS patients who would have bought coverage, who would have had more secure access to care. But because you created Obamacare to try to solve that problem, you have now left all of them with worse coverage, less coverage for the drugs that they need. Insurers doing everything they can to avoid them rather than appeal to them. And, provide them high quality coverage. And you're again, causing the cracks in the healthcare sector to widen in that, in that way. Right. This is why I said, we have to look at all of the margins. We have to look at how these interventions were contemplating affect all patients, because it, you, you might think you're doing something good by helping that one person with MS, but in fact, you're making M coverage for people, for everyone with MS much worse and causing more people to fall through the cracks. Tricky stuff. Michael, is there anything you feel we should have talked about that you'd want to bring up here towards the end of the conversation? Uh, healthcare is an enormous topic, so there are always things. <laughs> there are always more things to oh, talk about, been... always things that I wish we had brought up. But we've been going an hour and a half now. We've been going an hour and a half, and we have to stop, I think. We should not try your listeners' patience any further. <laughs> Michael Cannon, thank you very much for taking part in my podcast. It, it's been very, very fascinating learning a lot of, I've learned a lot about the US healthcare system and about how a free market system might look like in the future. Uh, hopefully in the near future. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. And thanks for listening. Thank you.